All right, welcome everybody. My name is Lori Luzader. I'm the Executive Director of Special Kids Connect, and I'm delighted to see everybody here this evening. Along with me is Jose Francisco Hernandez Rivera. He's our Community Services Director here at Special Kids Connect. And we are delighted to be hosting Disability Rights California for this four-part series on in-home supportive services. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the third. This will be covering how to calculate hours. Information from the first two are available on our website. If you go to the front page, there's a tab at the top that says Learning Center. And in that drop down, there is a um, link for IHSS. There are also links for SSI if you're interested in that service as well. Uh, and you can access the PDFs from this uh, presentation. And we're slowly but surely getting the recordings up there as well. So thank you for being patient with us. At the conclusion of tonight's workshop, we're going to be asking you to complete a survey so that we can get feedback on the effectiveness of this program, but also so that we can get your information if you'd like to have the materials mailed or emailed to you. And just give us a couple of days to be able to get those out. By the time we get them from uh, Maria and Mary Disability Rights, um, then we need to print them and get them into envelopes and stuff and send out to you. So um, be patient with us, but you will get them. And again, they'll be on our website for your access as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Mary and Maria from Disability Rights and let you guys take it away. Thank you, Laurie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Rios. I'm one of the senior advocates at Disability Rights California. For those of you who don't know who Disability Rights California, we are um, California's protection and advocacy program. Every state is federally mandated to have a protection and advocacy and Disability Rights California is um, the uh, protection and advocacy program for California. We are a law firm, a public interest law firm, and we provide services in different areas, legal services, counsel and advice. Um, in some cases we do represent, we do a lot of um, systems change um, advocacy, but we provide services in the areas of special education, regional center services, public benefits such as SSI, Medi-Cal. Um, we also provide services in the areas of mental health, housing, transportation, and many more. We have offices in uh, Sacramento and Oakland, uh, Fresno, Los Angeles, San Diego, and smaller offices in Ontario and other regional areas. Um, Maria is going to present today on how to calculate IHSS hours. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat, um, or unmute yourself to ask that question. She'll stop from time to time. If you would like an appointment to speak to Maria, I am gonna put my information in the chat box. You can reach out to me. I will go ahead and do an intake and schedule an appointment uh, for you to speak to Maria. Uh, so without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Maria Idiev, they're one of our senior attorneys. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, some of the material in this training, if you attended the last week's training on how to do an assessment, you'll, you'll recognize, but there are other, uh, some other tools that uh, social workers may use in, in figuring out what hours they're going to give you for each service. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a really quick recap of the services that um, IHSS provides. Um, and uh, then you're going to, we're going to talk about the fact that some people um, don't get 200, can't get 283 hours a month because of the program they've put them under. IHSS has four programs. It's not really, it's an umbrella and you have to think about it in terms of four different programs, four different funding streams. We're going to review a sample notice of action. Um, and then we're going to start going into the tools, the functional index rankings and the rankings for kids, um, the hourly task guidelines. This is a, if you attended our training last week, this was the, uh, an annotated assessment criteria resources is going to be new for you. Um, and um, the guideline, the functional index ranking guideline is also, uh, will be new to you too. Um, 
And then um, all of this information is in this, it's ACN, ACIN stands for All County Information Notices, um, issue number 97, issued in the year 2020. So um, you're, and this, this, this explains the new evaluation processes for social workers. So when the California Department of Social Services that it, this, this agency administers the IHSS program statewide. Whenever they want the counties to know things, they'll either issue all county information notices, all county letters. Um, and so all of the tools that you that, that are here that we're gonna review are in this material, this um, all county information notice. Also really important, all of the regulations with respect to IHSS are found here in this link. So if you ever wanna look up the parent of minor child provider rules, the, the, what services are available, the definitions, how people get paid, et cetera, everything, it's all here in the regulations. So, um, and it's also, um, the regulations are found in the California Department of Social Services, CDSS. Um, so um, let's start with an overview of services. As, as you may know, um, the services are divided into different categories. There's, there's a category of domestic services and there's a long list of services under that, like sweeping the floors, vacuuming, cleaning kitchen counters, cleaning the refrigerator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the material that we're gonna look at will actually define each service for you. Um, and one in particular will tell you where, what the regulation number is. So you could go directly to that for more information. Um, domestic services are not available for kids under the age of 18. Um, so these are uh, services that are available for adults. And then you've got a category related services and within related services, you've got meal prep, meal cleanup, laundry, shopping for food, shopping for other things, running errands, et cetera. Um, then you have a long list of non-medical uh, per, non personal care services, um, dressing, bed baths, regular baths, bowel and bladder care, menstrual care, transferring someone, you're moving them in and out of bed, out of off and on seats, um, hygiene, grooming, um, rubbing the skin if, if the person needs it, repositioning the person, range of motion exercises. Now, range of motion exercises can also be, can be a paramedical service um, if it's, um, if it meets the criteria for, or in the definition for paramedical services. And we, um, we reviewed that last week, um, the week before the basics. Um, care with um, putting on your prosthetic devices um, or medication setup. So this is not where you give the person the medicine into their mouth or in a tube, you get it ready for them to take. If it's something other than that, it could be considered a paramedical service. Accompaniment to, to medical appointments, is also a category of services. And there are special services like heavy cleaning and yard abatement. They're really given on a very limited basis when you need this type of service to remove a hazard. Um, so they're not, it's not to provide, you know, your cleaning lady to have every, every week or every month to come and do your heavy cleaning. This is very limited. And then we've got protective supervision. It's the only service where um, the program will pay you to observe someone. Because remember, the other ones are you're doing something. Either you're helping the person with the service or you're prompting them to do it. Because you can get paid to, maybe the person can do the service, but needs prompting to take medicine, to eat, to bathe. You know, because of the person's disability, they need prompting to do those services. And then the whole host of paramedical services. It's ordered by a licensed professional. The person can't do it because of their functional limitations. They need someone at home to do it. And it includes more than what you see here, you know, administering medications through tubes, maybe injections, checking blood sugar, um, 
anything that requires sterile procedures, um, et cetera. So um, those are the categories of services that are provided um, under the IHSS program. And so, um, you know, you have to be ready for when the assessment happens or the reassessment. And that was last week's training. And I think for those of you who attended the training and saw the sample um, self-assessment that we uh, used at a hearing, you'll realize just how detailed you have to be because um, you have to explain why you need the service, why you're asking for that much time for the service. Are there physical or mental limitations that cause um, they require more time to do the service. So for example, if someone has behaviors and, we, and, and they don't like to get dressed and they exhibit behaviors when they're getting dressed, that means, you know, it might, it might um, and you're asking for 20 minutes to dress, you know, someone, well, that may be a reason for the 20 minutes, but if you don't talk about why, you, why you know, you're asking for 20 minutes, the social worker is going to say like, you know, that's not reasonable. How long does it take a person to get dressed? It doesn't take 20 minutes. But so, but if you talk about why it's, it, you're asking for the time, that's really critical. Um, and so, um, and so I'm going to stop right now to see if there are any questions about what I've said, because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about why some people only can get up to 195 hours a month in IHSS. We're going to talk about those four programs. And then we're going to talk about proration and alternative resources. Those are two, two, um, two things that can cause um, the amount of IHSS to be reduced. Because what the county does is the county will, the social worker will determine your total need. And from there, they start deducting things. So if they have to prorate the service, then they'll deduct from the total need. If there are alternative resources where you're getting IHSS-like services are going to deduct the time that you get those, that you go to that alternative resource to get that service. So these are, these are things that will affect the amount of time you eventually get. So as I said before, IHSS, you've got to think about a it as an umbrella. And under this umbrella, there are four programs, the personal care services program, the IHSS plus option, the residual program, and the community first choice option program. When you initially get onto the program, you get a notice of action. And the notice of action will actually tell you, you are on the PCSP program or the CFCO program or the IPO program, and you're going to get so many hours. Most people don't know what that means. And really, it may not even matter that you don't know, but it will matter under a certain circumstance that I want to explain to you a little later. Um, so what are we're going to first uh, review what these pro what these programs are, and then we're going to go back to this chart so that I could explain it to you. Perfect. So let's talk about the PCSP program. If you are a parent provider of a minor child or a spouse provider, for your spouse, um, you will not be placed on the PCSP program. You might be placed on the IPO program. That's for parent providers of minor children or spouse providers, or you might be placed on the IPO program if you receive advanced pay. Let's say that I'm the IHSS recipient and I'm considered severely impaired under the program. There's a definition. Um, and so um, what happens is I can ask for advance pay. And so I'll get the money in advance to pay my provider. So at, because the other way to do it is the provider and, and the provider obviously has to submit timesheets, but I'm paying that provider at the end of the month in the middle of the month, right? Um, the other way is the provider sends in the timesheets and later on gets paid. Um, why advanced pay? Because usually people who are severely impaired can, it, it could be detrimental for them to lose their providers, especially because the providers are not paid, getting paid on time or, you know, as fast as they want to get paid. So they want to make sure that the providers are paid on time. So that's not a reason to lose the provider, right? 
Um, the other way you might be on the IPO program is if you receive a restaurant meal allowance. So if you forego meal prep, meal prep for example, I, the program can give you a little teeny weeny bit of money um, so that you don't receive the, the meal, meal prep uh, hours. Um, the residual program, um, these two programs here, the PCSP and the IPO, the federal government helps, helps pay for these services. But the residual program is a program where the state of California pays for the services. And it's for people that because of their immigration status, they're either lawful permanent residents and they have to, when you become a lawful permanent resident, you can't apply for, for example, SSI or Medi-Cal where the federal government is helping to pay. So California has this program, um, it's called the residual program. So you're either a lawful permanent resident within those five years, um, or you're someone who is a person residing under color of law that it's a category. And within that category of people, there's a long list of people who could be persons residing under color of law. That's called proof call. And so if you're in those categories, either lawful permanent resident within the first five years or proof call, you're going to be placed in the IHSS residual program. And then the last program is the CFCO program. And this is for people who if they were not living at home, they would meet the criteria to enter a nursing facility level, um, nursing facility at whatever level of care that nursing facility has, level A, B, subacute. There are other uh, levels of care. So there are a lot of kids and adults on the CFCO program. And I think still the federal government pays a little bit more for people who are on this program than it does for the other two. So why does it matter? Well, let's look, oh, and let me just um, explain severely impaired. So under the program, if you get 20 or more hours in the following categories, you're gonna be considered severely impaired, 20 or more hours a week. Um, so meal prep, meal cleanup, all of the personal care services, and paramedical services. So if you look at your notice of action and you add up all of the hours in those categories and they add up to 20 or more a week, then you're considered severely impaired under the program. Otherwise, you're um, considered um, um, not severely impaired uh, for the program. So let's go to the chart because this is what I want to show you. If you're placed on the PCS, oh, and another thing you need to know for protective supervision, there are only one of two hours that you can get. If you're severely impaired, you can get 283, but that's the most you can get in the program if you're in, you know, it's it. You can't get more than that in the program, no matter what. Um, but if you're, um, and, and if you're not severely impaired, um, you're gonna get 195 in protective supervision. So, if you're placed in the PCSP program and you're severely impaired, um, you can get up to 283 hours. But if you're, if you're not severely impaired, and let's say that you need protective supervision of, and you're, so it's 195 and you need 50 more hours in other services like personal care services, paramedical services, related services, then what, you, what will happen is that you're gonna get the 195 protective supervision plus the additional 50 hours, obviously up to 283, right? You can't pass that. And the PCSP program works the same way, the CFCO program works the same way as the PCSP program. Where it differs is in these two programs, the IPO program. So if you're non-severely impaired, you, you can only get up to 195 hours a month. So in a situation where you get protective supervision, you're going to get 195. But in my example, I'm not going to get those additional 50 hours. And it's the same thing with the residual program. 
So if you're placed in the IPO program, you might want to look to the CFCO program. Maybe you should qualify for the CFCO program. And what you see here in the last column are the all county letters that describe the program, the criteria for the different levels of care, everything you need to know about each program is in the, either the all county information notice, all county letter. Um, anyway, um, so this is where it matters. They put you on the IPO program, you're not severely impaired, oh boy. So you will, can only get 195 hours. How do I get more hours, right? Um, the, the, the residual program is harder because it's based on your immigration status. So I had a, a client who was, whose um, daughter was in the, uh, on the IHSS residual program because of the immigration status and they had given her 195 total. Uh, she needed more more hours and I said look you're going to have to focus on those services that would make you your daughter severely impaired so does your daughter need more meal prep time more meal cleaning time more personal care services more paramedical services that's really the only way that you're going to get more hours is, is if you move into the severely impaired category so we've looked at the different programs that IHSS has, um, and now you understand that some people will only get up to 195 hours a month because of the program they've been placed in. Um, we understand what severely disabled is. Now we're gonna talk about proration. The services of domestic services and related services. So when we're talking about meal prep, meal cleanup, laundry, shopping, uh, doing errands, um, those services may be prorated. So if, if I live with four other people and my provider cooks for me and the four other people, and these four other people are not receiving IHSS, then what the social worker will do is determine my total need for meal prep. Let's say it's eight hours a week. And then because they, they all um, eat the same food I do, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, then um, the county will prorate the eight hours, divide those eight hours by the five people who live in the household. Why? Because, <coughs> excuse me, why should the program pay a provider to cook for people who are not on the program? So, <coughs> excuse me, if there are people in the house who are benefiting from the provider's services who are not on the IHSS program, then there's going to be proration. So domestic and heavy cleaning can be prorated, related services can be prorated. Um, if, if the service is only provided to one person, of course, then there's no proration. Um, and so this is important to know because this, the proration will affect the amount of hours you get from the total need. They're going to deduct for proration. The other concept is alternative resources. So these are I just ask like services that you're getting from other programs. So if you go to an adult daycare program, to school, you go to a day program, anywhere where you're receiving the IHSS like services, those are called alternative resources. So let's say there's a child and the child is getting um, dressing, uh, feeding um, through IHSS. Um, but the child goes to school and those services are being provided at school too, because the child needs those services. So what the county is going to say is, well, wait a minute, you're receiving those IHSS services that we're providing you um, at an alternative resource, the school. And so they will deduct time that those services are being performed at school or at a day program or any other program where these services are being provided. Um, so those are really, um, those are really important concepts and proration and alternative resources will reduce the time that you get. Um, lots of kids get 
get uh, hours dinged for alternative resources because they're getting this IHSS service at school. And during COVID, when kids stopped going to school, parents should have re reached out to the social worker and said, hey, wait a minute, my kid's not going to school anymore. You need to give me back those hours that you dinged me, dinged my son for, you know, my child for alternative resources. I went to hearing on this issue because in my argument, we had asked for the client. So COVID happened in March. The client came to us in August. We asked for reimbursement for the, you know, to give back those alternative resources hours that they took out as of March when COVID happened and everything closed down. And the county refused. They said, no, we're just going to give it to him in September when he reported that his child was no longer going to school. So I went to hearing on this and my argument to the judge was, wait a minute, this is something that happened to all the kids in the US. It's not as if it was only for this child, right? Um, in fact, the social workers should have reviewed their files and for any cases where kids had been dinged for um, you know, alternative resources, the county should have adjusted that and sent a notice of action. Well, the judge did not um, buy my story. Um, and the judge said that um, people have a responsibility to report a change in circumstance. And since the father didn't report a change in circumstance until September, then you know we'll will uh, the county will reimburse them for alternative resource hours beginning in September because by this time we were into the next year for the hearing. So you just need to know that um, the burden's on you to report change of circumstances in the program. Um, and I just I found I found that to be unfair because it was we all everyone in the world knew that the schools were closed and the social workers should have gone through their cases and given back time for that they took out for alternative resources. Um, so let's go on to the next section. Okay. Sample notice of action. This is a typical notice of action up on the top right is the date of the notice. And then there's a very important date, which is the as of date. So that, let's say the date of the notice is April 1st, but the as of date is May 1st. So as of May 1st, services you get will change. So this is called the effective date of the notice. And if you read the back of the notice on appeal rights, it says that if you appeal before the effective date of the notice and you ask for aid paid pending, nothing will change on May 1st until you, there's a hearing decision. And if you win, then nothing will change, right? So, um, but if you don't do that, then your services will change as of May 1st and you have 90 days to appeal from the date of the notice. So it's really important to understand the aid paid pending if you're receiving um, services and suddenly something's happening to them. So the first column has all of the services. Domestic isn't really broken up into the subcategories, but we'll see what the definition of it is later. So you've got all of the services. You know that domestic is in months and the rest of the services are in weeks. The first column, so um, is total amount of service needed. So in meal preparation, in my example, let's say that the social worker puts that, um, you know, I need eight hours a week of meal prep. The third column is the proration column. So you notice that for domestic and related services, it's white, but it's gray for the other services, which means you don't prorate any of the other services. The only services that will be prorated are domestic and related services. And let's say that um, uh, I live with my husband and he eats all the meals my provider makes. And so my eight hours are gonna be prorated. And in the third column, there'll be four because eight hours divided by two. So now I, I, my hours have been reduced by four and the result of that will be in the fourth column. So now I have four hours for meal prep in the in that column. Now, the next column is services you refused. I've never seen that. 
or you get from others. This is the alternative resources column. So if I go to a day program and I get lunch there, then I'm going to be dinged for the time that I go to a day program and get lunch there uh, for meal prep and eat probably even meal cleanup. So this is where the alternative resources hours are taken out. The result is the last column, the now column. That's the now column. This is the notice of action now column. Your hours are going to now be effective May 1st now. What they were in the prior notice of action, and if that's an increase or decrease in hours in that service. And so what you do is you add up all of the weekly hours, you multiply that by 4.33 weeks in a month, that's what they use. You get a subtotal of all monthly hours, you add to domestic hours for a total. And then if you have any of these special category hours, they'll be added at the end. So that's a notice of action. Um, let's go. Okay, so functional index ranking. So the social worker is ready to review your case and decide how much time they're going to give you. So for each, each service that you request, the social worker is going to rank that service. So for example, for meal prep, if I say to the social worker, I can't use my hands. My disability prevents me from using my hands. I cannot cook anything. Um, the ranking of one is independent, meaning that I don't need a service. So that wouldn't be the ranking I would expect she would give me. Rank two is for people who can do the service. Let's say I may be able to prep my meal, but I need encouragement. I need guidance. I need reminding to prepare my meal. So this is the prompting rank. Rank three is I need some human assistance. Rank four, I need substantial human assistance. And rank five, I need total human assistance. And I would expect that for meal prep, she would rank that service a five. Rank six are for paramedical services. So this is the ranking. This is the first thing they do. Once they rank each service, then they're going to look at the hourly task guidelines. And we're going to go to that a little later because I want to show you first the functional, how, the functional index ranking for minor children, what they use to determine whether a child should get services. This is what they use. Judges look at this too. So you see that in the first column is age 0 to 17. Um, housework, domestic services are all ranked a one. And if you look under the notes, it says on the second one, minors who live with their provider parents must be assessed a functional index ranking of one in housework, regardless of an extraordinary need. So it doesn't matter what your child is not going to get any domestic services. But if you look at the first one, it says all minors should be assessed a functional index ranking of one when identified above unless an extraordinary need is documented. So for all these other categories in laundry, shopping, all of these, where you see a one, it's possible to get hours, but you have to explain what the extraordinary need is. And I'm gonna give you an example of a case where we went to hearing. So father lives alone with a son, um, son is 12 years old. Originally, the county didn't give the son any time for meal prep, meal cleanup, or laundry because it's a one on the chart. We don't give, and social workers may say, we don't, you know, this is your responsibility, parent. What I think what they're really saying is the functional index ranking for minor children has your child at that age with a one. So one means independent, but in, for children, it just means we're not going to give it to you. But they don't go on to say or ask, well, what so do you have an extraordinary need? I don't think, you know, I don't think it happens. But anyway, so in the case, we're going to talk about laundry because um, in this case, um, his 12 uh, year old uses diapers. He puts his hand in the diaper, smears. He has accidents in bed all the time. So there's a lot of laundry that happens. Once a week, the father takes the laundry, his laundry and son's laundry, and does the laundry. Typical. 
for a typical child, that's what you would do, right? But because of the child's disabilities, father has to go two more times a week to the laundry just to do his clothes because of everything that happens. That is the extraordinary need. And that's what we argued at the hearing. We argued that the extraordinary need was were these additional two times. Now, I also argued proration of the typical time. And I knew I was going to lose, but I just I wanted to see how the judge was going to address it. So and he addressed it the way I thought he was going to, which was take those two additional times and rank them and give the child hours. So um, after the decision gave the child hours in laundry, what happened in this case is that we went to a first hearing and the, the county agreed to reassess. They issued a new notice of action with some time in the categories of meal prep and meal cleanup but not, and laundry, but not enough. And so we went to hearing to get more hours and we did get more hours. We got about, I don't know, 40, 50 more hours a month for this child. And they gave them laundry, meal prep, meal cleanup. So it's really important that you understand if you're dealing with a child, this is where you begin. You look at your child's age and you look at the category of service that you're asking for and you look at the ranking. And if you see that it's a one in any category other than domestic, you've got to think about what extraordinary need your child has because of the disability. What is the extraordinary need? So for meal prep, for example, the, in the case that I had, the child has to have everything cut up in really small pieces. So that's an extraordinary need. A child, a 12-year-old child, a typical 12-year-old child doesn't have that, doesn't need that to happen. But because of the child's disabilities, he needed that. That was an extraordinary need. And the, the judge even, even used his behaviors while the dad is preparing the meal. The uh, kid acts up, has behaviors. Dad has to stop preparation of the meal to go deal with, with the um, behavior. I was on the fence about that I didn't wasn't quite sure I wasn't quite sure if the judge was going to say well okay so he stopped the meal prep and then we're dealing with behavior and then that the meal prep would start when the guy when the father came back after dealing with the behavior but no the judge actually used all that time to as an extraordinary circumstance that required more meal prep time. So I was happy with the result, but like, you know, sometimes you don't quite know what the judge is going to do because you don't know, quite know how it's going to work, but you argue it, right? And you, sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. But um, so anyway, I want you to understand that this is where you begin when you're talking about kids. And the functional, you know, functional index ranking is really important when, especially when there's a one, you're going to have to show an extraordinary need, which means you have to talk about it. You know, um, the other thing that we use when we're talking about kids, because I don't know about what, you know, I don't know everything that I need to know about a typical kid and when a typical kid at what age should be doing what. So, um, so counties use the adapted violent social maturity scale. And this kind of tells you that, for example, meal prep and meal clean at age five, you know, a child can use a table knife for spreading. Um, at six, they can use a knife for cutting. So we use this in, in, in those of you who, you, who attended the, the training last week about self-assessment, we use this to say to the judge, you know, a typical, when we were talking about, um, <clears throat> I think it was, um, yeah, um, meal prep and his need to have things cut into small pieces. You know, a child at five, a child at six years old can, can cut a knife or a child at five can spread with a knife. This child is 12 years old and he can't do that. So we use this when we're trying to compare what a typical child does with the child, uh, of, of, the, of an age with a child of that same age with a disability. The other thing that we do use um, and is used is the developmental chart. And that's the next one. Um, so if this tells you that, you know, by age, so for example, for ambulation, by 10 to 12 months, a child is standing alone, uh, walks unassisted in 15 months, runs by 18 months. So I use this 
to prepare for a hearing, again, to show the judge what a typical child can do and why this child is not a typical child and why this child needs the time. So um, these are good, good tools to use. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the next section, just to the yellow sheet. Um, Cause now the next thing that the social worker does is it once the social worker has um, given a functional index ranking to every service, the social worker will now look at the hourly task guidelines. So when you hear a social worker say to you, the most I can give you is seven hours a week, what they're actually referring to is the guidelines. But there's something very important that you need to know about the guidelines. So let's go to the hourly task guidelines. This is the next tool that is used. Um, so you see the service categories and then you see the rankings in different colors. And let's say that I ask for meal preparation, which is the first category. And the, let's say that the social worker ranks me a five. So if we go to the purple um, section, there's a low, mid and high rank. So they are all the same uh, for meal prep. So the, so, and I've asked for 10 hours of meal prep and the social worker gives me seven. And I call the social worker and I say, I got the notice of action. Why are you giving me seven hours when I ask for 10? And she says, it's the most we can give you. Well, what she's referring to is she referring to the guidelines and using the guidelines as an absolute number. Like you cannot go past that. They cannot ever go past that. Well, I'm here to tell you that yes, they can. If I show an exception and I show why I need 10 hours of meal prep, I can get it, okay? It may require me to go to a hearing because some social workers will just stick to their guns and not do anything to change things. But these are all guidelines. Anything you see here, you, if you have an exception for more time, yes, you can get more than the hourly task guidelines that are here. I always give this example because I think it's um, it's um, kind of uh, telling. I represented a, a guy who needed more than six hours in domestic services a month. Because of his disabilities, he had to have a very clean house. The county said, no way, we can't give you more than six hours a month. I said, yes, you can. We went to hearing and then the judge gave him over 30 hours of domestic services because I was able to show an exception to the six hours. We had medical documentation. We had our client testify. We had the evidence that convinced the judge that yes, he needs more than six. He actually needs 30 some odd hours a month of services. So whenever they say to you, the most we can give you is, and you'll know the guideline, um, you, you know, but before you even, I shouldn't have, you know, and my self-assessment at my assessment with the social worker, I will, or I will, I will have already told her I need 10 hours of meal prep. And this is why. And I talk about the exception. I talk about why I need this much time for meal prep, right? Because the, the social worker also has to have information to, to, to support their, the decision that she or he is do, making on every service. And if you don't talk about it, the social worker has very little to go on, right? I mean, look at the other side of the coin. Yes, they're supposed to be getting that information, but in reality, it doesn't happen like that. Everything is quick. They're there to sign papers and have you sign papers and do this. And, you know, I've, I, I've, I know of how they do it. Um, and um, you really have to take control and you have to be the one to, to give that information, you know? Um, and that's why that self-assessment is really important. Okay, let's move on to the next um, tool. So when the social worker, and this tool is called the annotated assessment criteria, and this tool actually helps the social worker determine the functional index ranking for every category. It starts off, um, and this is only a sample of the tool. It's a very big tool, so I wasn't going to put it all in the training material, but you have access to all of the tools in that link to that all county letter in the beginning. 
So, you know, it sort of describes to, um, you know, to the social worker, the types of questions they should be asking to, to determine whether there is a need for a service. Um, and then can you scroll down, please? Um, observation, social workers are, are, will observe everything that's going on in the house. They will observe the person who's applying. Um, so for example, if you're a parent and you say that your child needs um, help with ambulation moving from here to there, and the social worker is in the house and the child is moving around and playing without any help, the social worker is going to rank ambulation one and is going to put in her notes, I was at the assessment at the home. I was there for an hour and a half and I observed the child running around, moving from here to there without any assistance. And that's the kind of evidence the social worker will testify at the hearing. So they're observing everything and they're writing it all down. Um, and then it talks about the ranks. This is, these are the functional index rankings. And then there's a section here about variable functioning, which is important. If you're functioning functioning varies throughout the month, then the functional index level should, should uh, be the one that occurs the majority of the time in a given week or a given month. Um, and then it goes on, every, ser every service is defined. So domestic services are defined. This is from the regulations. These are all of the services that are included in domestic services. Someone, we get, we get this question every now and then about dogs. Uh, can I get the provider to, you know, feed my dog or clean my dog? No, this is not for animals. This is for people. And these are the services that they'll pay for. Um, and then it provides the, count, the social worker with observations to do, right? While they're in the home. Is the state of the home due to a functional limitations or conscious choice, right? Does it smell? You know, do you see pest infestations? These are all important observations for the social worker, right? Questions that they may ask about uh, domestic services. And then this is the important part, like, so for ranking number one, um, it tells the social worker, look, if the person is able to do the domestic chores, even though it takes time and the person has to do a few things that every day, that person is going to be ranked a one because they can do it. Yeah, so it takes a little longer to do it, but they can do it. And so the social worker would document that, right? Although the recipient moves slowly, he's able to do it and doesn't need assistance um, and, or does it every now and then. And so it goes on um, physically. So this is verbal direction. Example, um, recipient can physically, can you go back to verbal? Uh, recipient can physically complete the task. However, her condition creates memory problems and or confusion requiring heavy prompting or encouraging to clean the home. So, you know, that um, th that's an example of um, documentation that the social work put in the file. And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but this dot, this tool helps the social worker de determine the functional index ranking so, you know, you could, for whatever service you're looking for, you should look it, look it over. The tool will define the service, observations, questions that they could ask. They could ask all other kinds of questions, but those, these are all examples. So this is the annotated for the functional index ranking. And then the last tool is, um, remember the hourly task guidelines and I, and I talked about exceptions so that you could ask for more. Well, this is the hourly task guideline quick reference tool. So this tool will show you exceptions for more time than the time, for example, maybe the max time on the hourly task guide, but it also talks about its exceptions for less time that was than what's on the hourly task guideline. So let's go to another, let's go to meal, the next one, meal prep. So again, um, this tool defines the service for meal preparation, what is involved in meal prep. It tells you the, the regulation where you could find the definition for meal prep. Um, and then 
factors to consider for the social worker to consider um, is the is it, are the meals reheated meals or is dinner reheated from maybe lunch because that dinner is going to take a lot less time than the lunch did right because reheating a meal is not could take minutes whereas preparing a meal will take more time and maybe the lunch will be more because they're making you know whatever it is how frequently does the person eat um you know what does the person eat because if a person eats um for let's say for for breakfast i have a piece of toast and coffee that's not a lot of time right um so and when you're talking about meal prep you have to talk about breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, each one has to be evaluated, right? And you have to talk about how much, what do you eat for breakfast? So you see why this, this information is important, because that determines, like, you know, how much time should, you know, are they are there exceptions that would um, allow me to go outside of the hourly task guidelines? So for example, exact exceptions for low could be that they only they eat meals that require less preparation, coffee and toast for breakfast. Or if if you eat meals where you're opening up cans and warming them up, that could be an exception for low time, even lower than what the hourly task guideline has. Exception for high, they must the meals must be pureed or cut into bite-sized pieces. Exception for high. The person has special dietary requirements that require longer preparation times or eats more frequently. That may be an exception for more than the hourly task guideline um, gives. And for every, and then they have the ranking here, which is the same hourly task guideline ranking that you saw in the prior section. And every section is like this, right? So it's really important to look at that, at this. And these are only examples. This is not the universe of exceptions. You know, there may be other exceptions that you can think of for your situation. Um, so for every service that you're going to be asking for, look at these and look at the functional, the annotated um, document for functional. Look at this to see maybe there's something here that would be that you could use for an exception for more time, right? Like I said, this is not the universe of exceptions. These are only examples of things. And the doc, it's a lot, it's a long document. I only included a few pages of it so that you would get the gist of what this is. Um, and how you can use it. Um, and that's it. We've come to the end of the presentation.